So, who's going to introduce it? Why don't you? Thank you. You're Hello, you. everybody. <laughs> it is an absolute... You have no idea of what a joy it is to see you all here today. I mean, this has been a massive, massive project. Um, in fact, I was just saying to Jane a few minutes before we started, I can't think of any school's project like this, of this magnitude. Now, don't forget, I work nationally. I've never seen anything like it. You know, what, what we've done and what, and what you've done and that sort of mass involvement, uh, I've never seen anything like it at all. And the fact that it has had such a maximum impact across so many settings is absolutely incredible. So, you know, this is, this is a massive, massive big deal. And it's really funny because this morning, I kind of, uh, if you know me, I'm one of these people that doesn't really think about his day. I sort of get up and go to work. Because then when I got here, I thought, crikey, this is huge. You know, and then looking around the room and seeing you all here, I go, this is a room full of, well, I'm going to say friends, if you don't want to be my friend, that's okay. But, um, a room full of friends and people that we've worked with, you know, over this project. A project that should have been one year, and it's been over two years, because of, you know, little, um, little bugs flying around and this, that and the other. So, it's absolutely fantastic to be here. Um, putting something on the map. Uh, this was uh, Jane's, Jane's uh, words, first conversation uh, with me about it was, let's put Sutton on the map. And I thought, that's great, putting Sutton on the map. Um, it's also a massive thank you to Jane, because this is your brainchild, your idea, and, you know, uh, and we, you know we, we've worked really closely with Jane all the way through the project. Very much orchestrated though by you and Rebecca and Andrew. Well, thank you, thank you. But as I say, it wouldn't have happened, would it? So Teamwork. Teamwork, fantastic, yes. So, you know, again, and thank you all for, for getting along and bringing all your fantastic stuff to share with everybody. Really looking forward to, to doing that. So, um, anything to... No, we've got our plan on the next one. Got a plan, yeah, we've got a plan. You'll see how, how we work together. Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing, right? And I'm going to be, so I've got, a, I've got a reputation for being a little bit emotional and a little bit, you know, so, but uh, I've worked with Rebecca for two years on this. I've never liked working with anybody. You said I've never liked it. No. <laughs> I've worked with Rebecca over the last two years. Dreadful, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> dreadful. And, you know, and again, Again, sorry, I don't want to do this to you too much, but it's thanks to uh, Jane for introducing us together because it's really worked well. It's really worked well. I wouldn't want to work with anybody else. Yeah, um, you're a brilliant team. You two work fantastically together. You really do. Thank you. It's brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant! <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about the project and how it, and, and, and how it worked and... and and, and, and the structure behind it. So, you know, when we tootled into your school going, haven't you got any decaf? There was a plan. <laughs> there, there really was a plan. And then from there... Yeah, so I'm doing the data stuff around outcomes and kind of what, what data we captured and what that's, um, the conclusions it's kind of led us to at the end of it. Um, then back to Andrew with a sort of summary of some of the tales of the unexpected. <laughs> Stuff that we didn't think that was going to happen. Some good, some not so good, some very testing. Um, does anyone know what the magic F word is in education? No? Fired. Fired. <laughs> flexibility. Flexibility. We had to do a lot of flexibility on this. And, I mean, the one that made me laugh the most was your school, because we got kicked out halfway through the day, didn't we? Oh, no, we were there the whole day, we just left them to deal with the outbreak of COVID. Obviously. Did we yeah. not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were there all the time, they closed the next day, didn't you? Oh, was it the next day? Yeah. Oh, shows what the human memory was like. And then after that? Yeah, and then, then it's time to kind of be exploring all the um, lovely displays from the school. So there's bits we'll sort of maybe touch on in terms of the topics we've covered, but you'll see from the school's displays what they took from the training and the kind of outcomes and things that that's um, led to in their schools. And there's lots of lovely resources and things, so you might get ideas for your own setting and practice as well. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so, so there we go. There was something else I was going to add to that, and then it went. Mm -hmm. It's going to do it. I think it's my age. Um, right, okay, so, 
project, 14 certain primary infant junior schools. So we were initially given a list of schools to work with. The list, I think, changed on a daily basis, didn't it? Um, people left, people joined, and it just, I think, I think it originally started at about 10, and then went up to about 16, and then dropped down. Then we had different schools join halfway through, other schools, uh, maybe only one or two drop out for various reasons and come back again, you know, so there was a whole lot of that. But the idea was, the idea was, we, we called it the ripple effect. So this was the plan and this is what it all happened. So we would go into one school and we would do observations in that school. And whatever was the sort of key findings in that school, that would, that, that would then be converted into a training course. Okay? Now, originally, what we did was, we'd do a training course that was a full day, but it very quickly became apparent that that, that was just too much for people. So we ended up, they get, went down to about three hours in the end, didn't they? Two and a half, three hours. But whatever we found in that school that was the overriding thing, we would turn into a training course. The, da the, the, the dates and the names of the schools were not shared, so they were anonymous, although they didn't always remain anonymous because some things were so specific to the schools that it had to be shared. Um, uh, but, you know, we would always speak to the school before we do that. So we, d we did that and we delivered a training to everybody. So everybody attended the training. The idea being then, you added that to your school. So every, everybody got the benefit of, so if we did something on dyscalculia, we found dyscalculia was an issue in the school on the day, then we would, we, we would do a training event on that. All the schools would apply that to their practice. So we're getting this massive ripple effect. We would then do school number two, and we would do school number two, and then we would run another training event, and so everybody is getting that training. And so it's a, it was absolutely designed for maximum impact, which I think we pretty much achieved. The, um, uh, I clicked on one, sorry. Sorry? <laughs> I clicked on one, just one. Oh, okay. Um, we adapted everything for the needs of the group. So they were, pretty much bespoke training events. You know, they were written especially for. And a lot of stuff came up that we weren't expecting. So a lot of stuff we didn't expect to see, uh, which we're going through, a, I'll go through a list in a little minute, in a minute or two, to sort of, um, to give you some examples from there. They were live and they were recorded. Now the beautiful thing is, if you've not seen them all, or if you know any other certain schools that have not seen them all, they are available in perpetuity, which is, I believe, your new favourite word, isn't it? Yeah, I said, what, when you said that? Exactly <laughs> what? My, my <laughs> yeah, perpetuity, <coughs> yeah. You, forever. You'll always be able to get them, and if you don't know where to access them, Chloe Morris... Chloe Mo I've never met Chloe Morris, she knows everything. <laughs> she's like, you're not here, are you, Chloe? No, she's not. She's not. I've never met her, but she feels like my best mate, you know? <laughs> she just knows everything. So we've got that. So the idea is school implements it, so everyone's at the same standard. Everyone's doing the same stuff. Everyone has the same knowledge. And if you haven't got that knowledge, you can go and get it. It's there in Chloe land. Um, the, other, the, other, the other thing was sharing good practice with us. People were really good, really, really good at sort of saying, oh, come and look at this, Rebecca. Come and look at this, Andrew. You know, and you found out so many secrets. I don't want to talk, you know, really good secrets. Um, I don't want to talk too much about that because we're going to look at that at the end. But some of the stuff that was going on, and you think, how is this amazing practice going on in one little school, you know, down this little road, and nobody knows about it? This is something that we're going to talk about in a little while. Opportunity to widen our reach. What's that about? What does that mean? you remember what we were talking about when we were um, I think it was just that whole 
um, like you said about the recorded training and oh. then the effect of um, everyone being part of the training, the idea was by the end of the project, um, everyone would have kind of implemented and learned yeah. from the previous yeah. schools. So that maximum impact thing basically, isn't yeah. it? So we're going to have maximum impact on the... Right, here's the list of what we covered. <laughs> My goodness me, I'm going to go through it. Some of them are... are I'm, not going to, I'm not going to bore you with this. Um, uh, so, but I'm just going to talk about some of the ones that were, were quite incredible really. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. <coughs> right at the beginning. Right at the beginning um, where we were in one particular school and I think I spotted two undiagnosed fetal alcohol spectrum disorder children in one day. In fact, what happened was I was asked to sit with a child who they thought might have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and whilst I was sitting with that child, and I'm not naming the school, uh, but you know the school had picked up on this one, I said I think the child sitting next to this child is also fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is a big one, right? And believe it or not, this is one of the conditions that so it's so common to be undiagnosed and yet there are some absolutely um, sort of fail-safe ways of almost spotting it and flagging it up. So that was, that was right at the beginning, we didn't see that coming at all did we? Um, and so uh, you know put out a workshop on that. So that was an interesting one. So everybody knew to look for those facial features and things like that. Um, not going to re-deliver the training now. I'm sure those of you who've gone along to or access that training will know not every child with FASD has got the facial fit features. But, you know, that was a good starting point. So we did some on that. Um, zones around, zones of regulation, that was your baby, wasn't it? Yeah, and we've got, because um, I know from looking around at some of the displays and stuff, there's quite a lot of stuff, I think, from the foresters section, you'll see up on the board. Um, and we've got some lovely input from an OT who you can kind of chat to as you go around as well. So there's some um, bits we... Because that was the other thing, you, you, I think we talked about developing our own practice, that we were picking up stuff as well, weren't we, as we were yeah. going around, new ways of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd always used um, the incredible five-point scale up to that point, mm -hmm. and, and was, you know, given zones of regulation, and I was able to sort of combine the two and create a, a sort of bespoke version of that as well, so really, really good. Fantastic zones of regu re regulation video on there. Uh, ableism and language around disability, again, we weren't expecting that. Uh, uh, race and ethnicity and gender in specific language. That was one session. That's the one I enjoyed the most. Again, we didn't see that coming, did we? No. You know, and that kind of came out of certain, um, I think, a few schools that had sort of things popping up with pupils. And we, we then kind of created the training around that, but um, it was the, there's some of the slides printed at the back, so on the back wall there's a whole section on the kind of race, race and ethnicity part, and also neurodiversity and ableism is kind of stuck up on the side there as well. I think some of those um, slides are quite powerful, really. Yeah, really, really powerful. And um, and on that same event, um, we did one also about gender and language around gender, because. And I understand that people were getting confused, you know. Uh, do we call this person he or she or them or they or what, what have you? So we kind of uh, dismantled that and put it out there and, and sort of, uh, again, not what we were expecting. Straight away, down there, there's a whole load of training that I would never have ever considered ever delivering. You know, would not have crossed my mind at all. Um, Attachment disorder, anxiety conditions, and well-being. I always remember you have hard on that one. Um, I'm very anxious, you're right? So <laughs> you didn't seem too anxious, um, but 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 you know, I mean, you did add a lot to that as well. Um, when we were looking at all the different anxiety conditions and the patterns that were emerging through there, you know, there was things like children going to the toilet a lot. Yeah, and you go in actually, you know yourself when you're worried about something, it goes straight to your bladder. Yeah, and, and, um, and you know, we, and we kind of looked at that and say, and actually, let's look at this differently. If a child keeps getting up to the toilet or pacing about, it's actually probably something more than just getting on your nerves. 
you know, so... And also uh, on that one, it's, it's about the toilet sometimes being a safe place. So some, of the schools, um, sorry, some of the schools... Some of the schools... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know this displays again about nurture provision or um, sensory spaces, so creating them safe spaces as a result of that in school, somewhere that the child can go to kind of regulate emotions or, sort of, or just even kind of have some chill-out time so they don't get to that explosive kind of state. Which links as well to you know emotional based school avoidance and all those other themes we've sort of been seeing coming out in schools. Yeah, and that was that was going back to that. Where's Anna? Where are you going? Oh, there you are. Um, we were in Holy Trinity, and there was a child going in for half an hour in a sensory room in the morning. Yeah, before lesson started. Well, no, during lessons, wasn't it? During lessons. The argue, argument could have been this child's losing half an hour learning, but actually this child was gaining five and a half hour learning five and a half hours of learning by having that time in the morning. Really good stuff. Again, good sharing points. Um, classroom learning environments, supporting students waiting for provision. That was a big one, wasn't it? Because yeah. there were schools where they were saying about, um, you know, a child that maybe isn't in the right environment or the right setting, but actually we're, having to, we're waiting for a placement. Um, so it's been agreed that they are going to specialists, but it's just not the place at the moment. And what can we do to support that child while, while we're kind of holding them? Yeah. Um, Personalised timetables, targets, and sensory spaces. Sensory spaces was a big one because we managed to um, we managed to make some I'd cut some tentative links with TTS, uh, who are the who are the people who do the resources. You know, I've done the odd thing with them, and um, uh, and we got them down. And I think it was the first one was Muschamp. Where's Muschamp? Yeah, and they came down to name. Did they gut your school and rebuild it? <laughs> no, 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 but they, they, got their, they gave us some resources to use and yeah. then we took photographs and yeah. um, obviously back of children's heads, but, but they're using yeah. the resources and stuff and then Laura was just back to them. So yeah, we tried and tested. Yeah, so. Got to keep them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, we still have those contacts, so give me a shout and we'll try and if you want a visit from TTS. You know, I'll try and organise it for you. There's a lot of going on. <laughs> yeah, a lot of going on. Well... It works both ways, because they then have pictures to use to, yeah. to advertise their resources. So. It's, a, it's a scratch my all back situation, isn't it? And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it was pretty... I mean, and they're brilliant at this stuff. So getting them on side, and that's, you know... What's, what's the worst can happen if they've got something, you know? It could be worse, they could be working with Barnet. We don't want it, do we? <laughs> you know, so... Um, uh, outdoor, outdoor, sorry. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, outdoor provision. So that again uh, was um, was Holy Trinity started that, which we were looking at um, outdoor provision. Got this amazing thing, Kick London. You know, which is a Christian organisation that plays football. <laughs> it's a bit of a <laughs> did I diminish their responsibilities a bit? No, but, but anyway, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But the, the fact was, we didn't know this stuff was happening. We didn't know it existed. You know, and this is what I was talking about. One school in, you know, wherever, in, 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 in one little area, one part of Sutton, doing this amazing thing. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we didn't know anything about it. But we could then, and that was widening our reach, isn't it? Go into other schools and say... Are you aware of this that they're doing up there? Well, you know, give give them a ring and find out, you know, find out how to get it in there. So our knowledge was broadening, wasn't it? To yeah. be able to get that. And through. I think from that as well, because there was another school um that were really good with the outdoor provision, and we then started to realise, well actually we don't have to do all the talking, we can get the schools to talk about what they've got going on. So we started having more kind of slots and we did that with a few different schools where they had like templates of things they wanted to share with other schools. Um, which tied into that kind of enabling staff to have a voice, but we also talked about how um, you can get kind of teacher buy-in for like your school improvement plans and things like that, and, and some schools were creating working groups to focus on <coughs> certain topics in the school. Um, and I enjoyed that one about the neurodivergent staff members. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Because that was the thing. Sometimes we're so focused on the children, and we forget actually, you know, your staff members can be autistic, ADHD, etc. And how are we actually supporting them in the setting um, and thinking about kind of some of those strategies? So yeah. that was, I think that was quite useful, those ones. 
Yes. Oh, and the last one, the social model of emotional well-being. That was another one, and that's another pre-recorded. There's a separate video on that one as well, actually, about how the kind of layers of emotional well-being um, interplay, particularly around kind of um, if you're autistic or sort of different social emotional and social communication differences as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So. Now we're going to, uh, Rebecca's going to do a little bit about data. Thank you. And I'm going to nub in here and there. <laughs> um, so, we, when we started the project, we wanted to make sure that we had a range of um, data available um, and kind of different sort of sources. So we did we used a wellbeing scale for um, all year groups from year three upward. We asked schools for student questionnaires for the selection of students and also this photo project, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, and we asked for some kind of set school data as well. And we did it at the start, which was autumn 2020, and then at the end, which was kind of spring for the summer the school data, but summer for some of the pupil data of this year. So as you can see, kind of stretched a bit longer than originally planned. Um, so the, the children's outcome data we used was, or the scale we used was the Sterling, um, children's Wellbeing Scale. So this was devised by an educational psychology service. Um, it's validated, so it's kind of been used in lots of different settings and been kind of shown to be a good measure. Um, and it's kind of a positively worded scale, me measures emotional well-being, um, and there are a few um, kind of trick questions. So there's a few in there that, um, things like, I always share my sweets. So if they're like, yeah, 100%, <laughs> you know, mm, they might have just gone tick, 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 tick. So there's a few that kind of um, test the validity in there as well. Um, so the data that we got from the project showed that um, at the start of the score out of, out of 60, um, the initial score was um, 47.1 out of 60, and at the end it was 52, so it's obviously the average. So it's gone from kind of 78% up to 88%. And interestingly, the average for kind of nationally is 44 out of 60. So Sutton schools had already started off um, with pupil well-being being higher than the average, um, but over the course of the project, it had also increased, which is obviously um, for us kind of the most important thing, really. But interestingly, with, with all, all data, um, you sometimes the more you look into it, the more questions you have. <laughs> so um, some of the things for me were then about this is obviously just with primary, so how does that shift as they go to secondary? Um, obviously, the nature of it being all year threes upwards completing this, it was generally done like in the classroom or the ICT suite, so they're all together doing it, maybe a bit of pressure to kind of get through it, what's my partner written? So it may not be you know, completely um, an honest reflection, but <coughs> useful data to, to have and kind of reflect um, on. And before you move on, yeah. a whopping 10%. That's pretty cool, really, isn't it? Ten mm. percent, you know, from from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. I thought that was incredible. Yeah, yeah, which is yeah, that's, that's the aim, isn't it? If you could get ten percent every year by doing this, you know, <laughs> that that would be quite yeah. incredible. Um, so then we had these pupil questionnaires. So this was um, a selection of students. Um, so each school chose the students that they wanted to do these, and they were kind of students who maybe. Um, they felt were like were not necessarily accessing the full curriculum or not always completely included or kind of something that they sort of struggled with, maybe the school struggled to support them. Um, and one of the questions was around how you feel at, about school. So they started off with an average of 3.12, but that shifted up to 3.67. So again, um, a kind of smallish increase, but out of five, so it, it's not bad. Um, and again, you know, questions about, um, there's always questions around the data, but it's um, useful to see that and good for us to see that's increased. Um, and some quotes from it were, were things like, every time I'm at school, I can hear the fire alarm in my head. So some of these questionnaires were done um, at the start and, um, sorry, they're all done at the start and at the end. So we could sometimes pick out kind of key themes that then fed into our training. Um, but also it's just interesting to kind of gain the, those insights. And one of the sessions we did was around the data um, with schools and looking at how you could use it going forward, because obviously this is just for the study, but in your own school settings, it's really useful to have these insights. Um, I like finding a place I can be alone if I'm really stressed. 
So again, this was one of the ones afterwards when um, schools had implemented more of the kind of sensory zones, places of peace where they could go to that was commented on, which was really good to see. Um, and just comments about um, what great teacher is. And again, we talked a lot about processing speeds and trying to slow things down, not give too much verbal communication. And we talked a lot about connections. I remember really clearly in one school where you said to a boy, you're chatting to a boy, and you said, um, it's been lovely to meet you, or a pleasure to meet oh, you. Oh, I remember. And he turned around and he said, oh, no one's ever said that to me. Yeah. And um, we were like, <laughs> and um, we talked quite a lot about, you know, seeing the children represented going around the school, if you go in the classrooms, can you see their personalities celebrated? Um, and so it's nice to see that being highlighted, that actually that is important, that a, a teacher that kind of listens to really feel validated by it, really. There, there were several occasions like that yeah. where we had, oh, there was another one, um, there was another one in, um, in, in, in one of the secondary schools, which was kind of, things like got added onto the side, almost, it's hard to explain, isn't it? But yeah, not part had, of the project. Not it? part of the project, but during the project, little things got done. And I remember talking to a, a young boy about his ADHD, and he said, um, I said, are you medicated? He'd got a new diagnosis, and the, the Senko wanted me to go and speak to him about his diagnosis. And I said, are you medicated? He said, no. He said, um, why? He said, it's my... It's my cultural identity. Why would I want to change that? Mm -hmm. You know, and this is this is pupil voice at its yeah. absolute strongest, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, really good stuff. Um. So then, just kind of some of the words that were picked down from um, feedback about things that helped when they were stressed or worried. So again, a lot of such sensory um, comments about putty, dimble, breaks, um, cushions, like distraction, things that were again had been some things that we've been working on. Um, Part of the trainings, best part of the school day, and this is um, you know, <laughs> um, the open equipment was linked to what you're talking about in terms of outdoor provision. Um, so I know Devonshire unfortunately had to um, pull out last minute because of um, staffing and COVID cases, but they were going to have a display around their outdoor provision. So if that's something that you um, are a school or you know of schools that want to kind of look at things that are going really well, that's a place to visit. And there's, um, a video, there's a video of that as well. We made a video of that. Did we? A training video, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You were there. Was I? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, right, it's just again, it's, it's kind of what we expect, but there was, um, I don't think any English and math on this bit. <laughs> oh, no, there is English, there we go. Um, but break is suddenly in much bigger letters, lunchtime in big letters. Um, so it's again, and we talked a lot about that, tapping into the child's interests and giving them that kind of focus for the future um, rather than it just being about you know that lesson or that year group actually if you can tap into something that gives you a passion um, you know it's more like to help with the really poor statistics around employment for autistic students for example um, so the photo project so this is a kind of a sort of little baby of mine um, so it's, it's known as the mosaic method um, and I, about five years ago, I did a project in a few summer schools for, as part of my um, master's dissertation. And one of the things was we were comparing um, research methods and sort of preferences for autistic students. Um, and there's kind of data out there um, generally to suggest that using photographs is more kind of, um, it's easier to process basically. Um, and you get kind of different kind of data. So it's obviously visually friendly. Um, which, and that's not just in relation to autism, but a lot of areas of kind of neurodivergence, it's easier to process things visually than lots of verbal kind of questionnaires or interviews. Um, the photos then can be something you can kind of interact with together and, and have discussions around. So I know sometimes when I'm, if I'm meeting like a student for the first time, I might get them to bring in some photos from something they did at the weekend or their favourite animal. So it just kind of gets that conversation flowing more. And we did, we did find that children shared a lot more through this process than they would have done necessarily for the questionnaires. Um, can reduce anxiety, so where I said about <coughs> with the other data, um, some students might be feeling a bit stressed out or like, looking at their partner, am I writing the wrong thing? There isn't really right or wrong for, for mm -hmm. using photographs, it's what's important to you. Um, and data showed young people preferred this one over other methods, um, and they said that they felt more relaxed doing this. 
Uh, and I know through this process and in the past that there were topics that came up that um, hadn't been mentioned through any of the other methods, so it kind of gave a different type of data. So at the start, there was quite a, a focus on um, sort of likes and dislikes, things that are important to them, and a few sort of additional insights. So we had things like um, their interests, so again, celebrating kind of their key passions, um, fish, art, um, things they did the weekend. And even, I like that picture of the bottom there, because you can just see this kind of sense of pride in his face. Um, and what was nice, again, was looking back uh, when the students then did this um, as a repeat, exercise at the end, they had often forgotten about this and then could look back and go, oh I did it. Now I, you know, things have changed or I've achieved something that I didn't think I was going to. Um, comments on subjects and sometimes there was useful um, comments about things like I don't like um, meal time, it feels really packed and claustrophobic, so then there's things the school can do to maybe uh, make adjustments around that. Can I just snub in as well, sorry. Yeah. Um, when we were looking at things that were important to the children. The, ex the other thing that we had to put in that mix is, how does that correlate to things that are important for the children? So what is important to them might not always be beneficial to them. And so we would have to look in and say, okay, this is great, but how does this benefit you? Or how does this not benefit you? And also if it does benefit them, how can we then integrate that into that child's curriculum. So, mm. so and do yeah. you more because sometimes it's just as subtle as I think I can't we've talked about it in this one or this more recently, but I was talking to a student in year thirteen, um, in a grammar school and he was his thing was dinosaurs and it had been the interest that had gone the whole way through with him because he'd been able to like explore it to deeper levels when he was older. And um, he was saying if he was doing a lesson and it's just a picture of a dinosaur on in the corner of the worksheet, suddenly he's like back in the room. Um, so it, it's sometimes just you know as simple as that mm. to kind of and there was yeah. one we worked with um, who they were doing a lesson on verbs and adverbs and the text that was being used was good night Mr Tom. And um, a, a, and he was totally disengaged but he had he'd written his own book about monsters, it was like a scrapbook, and, and I took him out in the corridor and we just talked about verbs and adverbs in what he'd done, and he was petrified up, and we all know this stuff, we, we, all, we all know this stuff, but it's just about sort of, just kind of remembering, I mean the miracle I remembered, but, um, you know, just kind of remembering, oh yeah, but maybe we can get through in this other way, and I know it's all about special interests and we do it all the time, but they do work, don't they? My goodness me. Mm -hmm. You know, the things that are important to them. Uh, friendships, again, that came up um, quite a bit. So there's sometimes specific people around school that were important to them or different um, kind of exercises. Um, play, break times, equipment, um, comments on kind of maybe things. So, so again, this could be tied in like with school improvement plans or school council, things that are um, important to students or things they want to see adapted. Um, and there were some comments again, and I thought this one was quite important, and this is like the little thing I've seen it um, in schools where the registers left up on the whiteboard by accident, you know, especially in secondaries, and there's key data about pupils and it gets seen by everybody, um, and it's, you know, personal things that teacher might not be aware of, that be a massive thing to that pupil. Um, so for them it was around attendance that again it's being shared with everybody um, and you know for them it was a big big kind of thing for their well-being. I don't remember this one. Yeah, yeah. it's good that we came today isn't it? Yes, <laughs> I've learned um, something already. So, um, so at the end of the um, programme, so when schools then repeated this with um, the students, there was um, kind of more reflection on some of the, the changes in their own progress that had kind of occurred in that time. So um, I like this one, talk. this was obviously linked with the kind of sensory um, tools that were available, um, things about like spinning tops, stuff they're doing at playtime, so I'll just leave you to read that. And then kind of the importance of fidget tools. And then the next one um, 
I really like this because they've taken a picture of a display where it had everyone in their school um, linked together and saying they'd like to be connected with their friends. Um, and again, this is the kind of simple stuff. Some classrooms, it's very um, academic focused and you can't see the identities of the children being celebrated and you want it to be kind of an extension of their home in a way that they feel, you know, comfortable and also celebrated who they are so they can be confident and happy to be their true self. Uh, our structured time, so again, we touched on this and um, how to kind of provide more structure for that. So they talked about things that are available for them, um, liking the structure and, and meant that they avoided some games outside that could potentially cause problems. Um, so, and again, it's great that they had that self-awareness of, you know, I can choose to go and play that game, but I don't always have the tools to kind of get out of some of these difficult situations. <coughs> Sometimes it might be better to um, engage with something kind of a bit calmer in the day which again links, links to the zones as well. Um, the nurture group, so again we talked quite a lot about the, that kind of emotional well-being provision. So um, he talked about how um, important that was to him and helping him to kind of stay in, in the class more as well. Um, and this one was about, um, we, we talked again about places of peace or sensory dens or places you can go in school. Um, so she said where, where she can go to read and relax. Um, but again, that, it's good to see that she, it was, she was aware that she could access that because some, um, sometimes there's kind of a room available but it's not always um, accessible or the child is just isn't aware that it's an option for them. Um, so this one, it's <coughs> nice to see the kind of sense of achievement, something I didn't think I'd be able to do before, um, playing for the school team. And then about PE, and I like this one because they said about um, the coaches were able to um, explain activities clearly in small chunks, and that's something we talked about a lot, wasn't it? Chunking down steps yeah. for tasks, yeah. reducing language, all of those kind of um, strategies. So, and in, in, as part of the um, project, we talked about the implications for schools. So, obviously, we've done these methods for um, the project to kind of see the impact of what we've been doing, but the aim is that. Um, schools are then able to use some of these things on an ongoing basis. So we looked at how you might be able to use the, the kind of mosaic approach in schools. Um, and schools said about maybe sharing ideas about how they'd like to learn with the students, um, identifying kind of key areas around school, which might um, fit in with school improvement or um, adaptations and ideas. Reflecting at the end of the year group, so maybe the, a kind of learning questionnaire, um, and a way to create connections with people with other interests. So, you know, if you find, oh, they've taken a photo of a really unusual thing, student you know, I love lampposts. So you might discover, oh, that's their passion, and, and perhaps somebody else in, in the borough maybe might love lampposts, and you can link up somehow. It was um, not as part of joining this project, but not part of this project. This is another school elsewhere in the country. Uh, I was working with a little boy in year one who had done an incredible five-point scale. And when he was at his most angry, number five, his comment was, go away, leave me alone. So I'll call him George. And I said, George, I said, this is fantastic. I said, you've done this, go away, leave me alone. You've, you've worked all this out yourself and that's great. I said, so this is what you want people to do? And he'd go, yes. And I said, can I ask you, I said, and when you are really angry, do they go away and leave you alone? And he said, no. He said, they always try to give me a hug or sit with me, in the, you know? And I think this is what we're talking about, isn't it? Is to take that information on and listen to them, and listen to them. And I think this has been a massive part of what the photo project is about, is to get that, what, what I call intel, get that intel on board, absolutely act on it. And that was, I remembered earlier, and ties in with this, we did do quite an exception on use of technology, didn't we? So yeah, yeah. We saw some really good um, examples of that in different schools, um, and obviously we're kind of dinosaurs, all of us really, compared to the, the young people we work with and where they're going to be heading with technology. So that was a big thing as well, that obviously, if you send a child off with an iPad around the school, they're going to be a whiz at doing that and yeah. feel empowered, and it's yeah. again part of a good um, exercise. So. Tales of the unexpected. Tales of the unexpected, my goodness me. You look at my face, look at that face. I'm only 28. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the, the project 
itself was, again, was the most exciting thing. I, I'm a bit of a boring person. I love my work and I love what I do and I get excited by my work. And, uh, uh, and, and to be given this project, for the both of us to be given this project was fantastic. So the first thing we did was we sat down and we did dates, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Which is not either of our strengths. Which is not either <laughs> of our strengths. <laughs> and On version uh, ten. <laughs> yeah. And um, we sent this stuff out, and um, and people were emailing me. Some people, yeah, I mean, it was COVID was rife. I mean, it wasn't like COVID now where people are getting a cold for a few days. This was proper COVID, you know, where schools were shut in and and everyone so was. Due to start January twenty one. Yeah. When it's locked down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing about it now, but it was really horrible. Yeah. And everyone was really angry. Everybody. We were angry, you were angry, everyone was angry. Not angry, but just a stress like this. And so we sent out all the dates, didn't we? Yeah. And they all came bouncing back going, that's it, no, that was it. I sat and did the dates on Christmas yeah. Day. <laughs> I sat and did the dates on Christmas Day. I wasn't having my children till the 27th. So I sat down, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, with a bag of crisps and some sandwiches. And I did these dates and I put them on a delayed sand for January the 4th. Just put them all in my outbox. January the 4th, I was ironing. And the... Sco no, it was the Scottish secretary, for, it was the, the Scottish woman, whatever her name is, Sturgeon announced they're going into lockdown and I thought hmm Boris is going to follow this so I hopped in my car went and bought a loaf of bread come back <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah basically all these emails went out and of course people had thought I'd written them that day <laughs> and then they're like what kind of idiot are you <laughs> um, and, and I'm like no these were done weeks ago and and then because neither of us are particularly good at that sort of organization skill I was getting, you know, you might get half hard ring you up and come, Andrew, this is like Good Friday, what are you doing? Yeah. And so we had all that. And it was actually very, very, very stressful. And everything got put on hold again. And then we had to redo all the dates again. And we did actually, not one school backed out over COVID, not one. You know, and we managed to get in, I mean, we, we had to do some pretty sort of extreme practices and <coughs> obviously not extreme considering the situation. But, um, but yeah, you know, absolutely extreme practices and there was lots of cancer or postponements, but nobody pulled out over COVID. And do you know what I think, and we've discussed this before, is that when I think we got a better job because of COVID. Because we went in when schools were struggling to keep it together. Yeah? And everyone was being creative and everyone was doing different things. And if you can pull off that kind of taking in visitors uh, at that time and for us to do the observations and unpicking what's what. Uh, you know, for example, when we did the dyscalculia thing, part of that was COVID because the children weren't able to use the uh, tactile resources, you know? And so the massive impact on maths teaching was huge. You know, it was a massive impact was huge, get that one. Um, you know, but, but, but so this, this was, I, I, I'm not gonna go so far as to say it was a blessing, but it did, it did open up new lines of interest. Um, it did open up new lines of interest. So, uh, yeah, the fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder stuff, we talked about that at the beginning. But there was those, those areas, like, so we just talked about the maths. Uh, other things where tactile resources were important, like dyslexia. How could we be creative around dyslexia? So instead of using um, overlays and things like that, you know, supplying children with coloured punch pockets and you know using their normal rulers as overlays and, and stuff like that did again pull out a lot a lot a lot of um, a lot of new new opportunities and new ways to do things 
which we now know, you're still doing them. You're still doing them and you're doing the, you know, uh, you, you're using these ideas from before, so it helped us evolve. Peer learning walks, this is something. We've not really got this going officially yet, but this is something that, that uh, Rebecca and I are very, very keen to get going is the practice that we've seen in the schools has, has been, there's been pockets of just, okay, so you're all magnificent anyway, but there's been pockets of uber magnificence. So there's one particular school, um, uh, uh, one particular school, I went into a classroom and I saw the best ADHD lesson I've ever seen. You know, <coughs> where the teacher had just purely coincidentally had got several ADHD children in the classroom and could only teach in that method. And, and she got everything down to three, five and ten minute sections with timers and, and things like that. And, we um, talked about that, didn't we, about like lesson structures, and yeah. examples of um, uh, adaptations of personalised timetables and things as well. Absolutely. As you're talking, all this other stuff's pinging up mm -hmm. before we get oh, I know, it's, uh, the stuff we saw, <laughs> we, you know, I feel like my brain's exploding. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so we got this, and, and I, the way it was handled was in that perfect, don't give them time to breathe, ADHD style <coughs> learning, yeah? It, you know, they're moving on all the time. Well, I'd never seen anything like it. In fact, we'd at that time been in touch with the ADHD Foundation and they couldn't give us the name of a school that was doing good ADHD practice south of Manchester. And we got it right here in Sutton. One teacher there doing this amazing stuff. So we want people to see that. So we really want to organise those learning walks. You know, some of the outdoor provision. Some of, the, some of the considerations that schools have had. You know, one school had looked at the area that their school was in, which was particularly uh, blocks of flats, no outdoor play areas, you know, and so everything was built around getting the children outside more. You know, and again, that's gold. It's absolute golden, you know, if we can get people doing the learning walks, you know, the, 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 the sensory environments, again, one of the schools got seven sensory rooms. You know, and you go in, this has got to be shared because actually what they'd done was not because of, was not because of they'd got some amazing school with seven purpose-built sensory school, sensory rooms. It was because they'd been creative. They've been creative and they used space incredibly well. Again, we need that, don't we? We need to go around. Some of the outdoor provision, so, you know, uh, we saw two that had got very different, but, but, but very, very, very innovative outdoor provision things going on. Again, want to get these learning walks. I want everybody to see that ADHD friendly lesson. I want everybody to see these creative rooms, you know, these create. Um, so, uh, and again, that sort of moved onto us networking with resource suppliers. So, for example, um, so we were using the boards, the social story boards and the worry boards and things like that. Well, I designed those years ago. A company had made them, and the company has gone bust. But based on that, <laughs> I got in touch with TTS, TTS are going to start manufacturing them again. You know, so we've, you know, our networking inwards is also going outwards.